The diving team from England and Scotland avoided publicity while they worked here at Streeja off the North Sligo coast. They were exploring seas where three vessels belonging to the ill-fated Spanish Armada were shipwrecked in 1588. Over the weekend, the diving team brought ashore three bronze cannon discovered in a massive wreck buried in sand on the seabed. The guns, all Italian made, are in very good condition. One is marked 1570 and has the figure of a bishop on it. Another of the identifiable markings is the name of a southern Italian town, San Severo. All three of the vessels wrecked off Sligo in 1588 were part of an Italian squadron of grain ships. They had been commandeered by the Spanish to transport heavy siege guns. The weekend discoveries also include a cannonball. It and the guns, one of them 10 foot and the other two 6, are being stored in the Board of Works offices at Drumahair. Interestingly, the team believes the vessel it discovered off Streeja is the Juliana. Up to now, many historians believed this vessel had gone down off Bloody Foreland in County Donegal. The advisor to the divers who've been working here is Dr Colin Martin of St Andrews University in Scotland. And according to him, this discovery must rank in importance with that of the Mary Rose off the southern English coast. He believes that there is a wide variety of artefacts available here, varying from personal possessions of the Spanish to military gear. And the vice president of the Irish Maritime Institute, Dr Vince Carruthers, has described this as one of the most important archaeological discoveries of the century. The members of the City of Sligo Pipe Band rarely have to exercise their limbs and lungs, leading national champions on a victory parade. They last had to do so when Sligo Rovers won the FAI Cup in 1983. But this month they were on the road once more with the Sligo Minor Hurling Team, winners of the All-Ireland B Division Championship. The players, all dressed up in Sunday best, defeated Tyrone in the final. The B Division is designed to promote hurling in the weaker counties like Cavan, Longford, Louth, Donegal and Fermanagh. Sligo GAA teams have a dismal record at inter-county football and hurling levels. So, understandably, success generates its own excitement. At the steps of the town hall, the players and mentors were welcomed by the Mayor of Sligo, Tony McLaughlin. Upstairs in the mayoral parlour, Councillor McLaughlin paid tribute to the hurlers. ...that I have the privilege on behalf of the aldermen and members of Sligo Corporation of according you a civic reception. To win a major title in football is worthy of note. But for a Sligo team to win in All-Ireland at any level in hurling is quite a remarkable achievement. As the celebrations got underway, the team captain, Finbar Filan, talked about the significance of the victory. It's such an honour for Sligo because we're an unknown county in all forms of GAA. This is the first time in 12, what is it, since 1971 that anything has happened. That was just an under-16 title. And we've progressed up the grades and hopefully we can break into the senior ranks now. We're in the doldrums, we're really the bottom of the pits. And now there's no place left for us to go but up. And this is a stepping stone for us to start. What, <coughs> excuse me, what sort of obstacles did you have to overcome in order to win this? Well, we all started hurling when we were... 12, 13 in national school and we progressed up along, the, up along the ranks and picked up the different skills and we all, this year we put an awful lot into it this year, we weren't a brilliant team, we were a very dedicated team and we trained four nights a week, most of us, and then we had a very hard run, we met Blancourt and they were like red hot favourites and we beat them by two points in the semi final and we progressed to meet her own then in the final. Before leaving, the team members were asked to sign the visitor's book. Just to put it on the record that in 1986, Sligo hurlers arrived in style. An arts festival was what they said they were organising in Sligo. After all, hadn't there been a string of arts events in provincial towns? Galway had one, and Kilkenny, and Clare Morris, and Ballina. So Sligo was in line for its ration of culture too. The events began on Friday last and will continue through to Sunday. The programme of activities is adventurous for a first-time effort, but it's among the young that the whole concept has really caught on. This wall mural is in the middle of Sligo's main car park. The initials SAF stand for Sligo Arts Festival, 
just in case you're slightly distracted. And the group from a local school are quite proud of their efforts. The experiment was repeated elsewhere. Two weeks ago, this old hoarding was nothing short of an eyesore. In the name of art, it has been transformed, and shopkeepers in the area are thankful about the work. It seems that youngsters are able to tread in places where the local authority hasn't the power or maybe the necessary finance to act. But what of the festival organisers? Um, it was our intention to have a very varied programme because we're trying to interest everybody in Sligo. Normally arts events, people think of them as being limited to a small section of the community. So we've gone for creative activity for everybody, cafes. What um, aspect of the arts week has delighted you most? Well, I think the response of the people in Sligo. Um, last weekend there was a great buzz around Sligo and we had a load of street entertainers down from Dublin and from Sligo. And um, just the reactions of the people. We have an, an amazing number of exhibitions going on. There's over a dozen major exhibitions with a number of smaller things. And um, a lot of them are in places where they wouldn't normally be held. Labour exchange, banks, shops, shop windows. And I think people are visiting these things. And um, I'm just very pleased with the overall reaction. The exhibitions and recitals behind closed doors are impressive but the real fun is on the streets. Again, local children make up this mime group. They've been popping up in all sorts of places. Not bad entertainment to view while doing the shopping. It's fun and it's free. The lineup for this year's competition to find Ireland's strongest man. First, 26 year old Francis Cadden, the local contestant, a power lifter. Next to him, from Limerick, David Frateroli, the Irish junior and intermediate powerlifting champion. Beside him, a Killy Gordon, County Donegal farmer, Noel Gallen, a competitor from last year's final. And on to Martin Kyo from County Wexford, a member of the Bowley International Tug of War team and the man who came seventh in this year's World Ploughing Championships. Beside him, the Irish champion hammer thrower Sean Egan, who currently works at the Belfield Sports Centre in Dublin. And finally, to Willie Horsky, the reigning Irish strongman, a County Donegal man based in London, and the world record holder for one-armed deadlifts. The Sligo Sports Centre was packed to the rafters for the contest, which featured six different tests. The event was the idea of Pat Curley, a PE lecturer at Sligo Regional College. It's open to competitors of Irish nationality over the age of 18. It's not just a test of strength, technique and stamina are crucial as well. In this event, contestants have to pull and push a Land Rover over a set distance against the clock. And Martin Kill swept across the line. And Sean Egan's very, very quickly behind him. The bar test involves bending one meter sections of steel. All six That's contestants got through the early rounds with ease. And by the time they reached the bars half an inch in diameter, five of them were left in the competition. They had to perform the task, bringing the bars to a distance of less than 12 inches apart within a set time. Really, really determined to bend this bar. The bar bending test ended in a five-way tie, but by the time the competitors reached the final event, the loading test, Martin Kyo of County Wexford was in the lead, with Francis Cadden of Sligo in second overall position. All that Martin Kyo had to do was complete the exercise, and there was no way that he was going to lose sight of the title now. I've been taking part in competitions in, in national championships since 65. 
in ploughing and, in, and later years in 67 in tug of war and from 67 on in pulling tug of war and nationally and internationally. Now you work as an agricultural contractor, does that actually help you to train for events like this? Well, it probably gets the toughness, like it's a very tough job, very physical, hard work like in, involved in it. So like you don't maybe need as much training as such for this event as one would like working in an office or that type of work, you know. And you're advised anybody who'd think of taking up these kind of tests? Well, I think to, for a start, they want to be very careful in, in their approach to it. They want to get very good advice in if they're going in for weightlifting or anything like that. They want to be very well coached. So as the clean-up operation begins here, it's been clearly decided that the winner of the competition is 37-year-old Martin Cho from County Wexford. He's 16 and a half stone, and believe you me, he's a very strong man. It's no more than fitting that the champion is produced from a building in the very part of Sligo. The role that the weekly publication has played in the history of the town and county is fully documented in a special supplement marking the 150th anniversary celebrations. It's a very impressive souvenir, a gold mine of local history recalling important events and personalities. It was researched and compiled by the paper's editor, Seamus Finn. What struck him as he sifted through musty back issues and old documents was the role played by past provincial newspaper editors in the development of Irish society. A lot of the local editors were involved in politics and spent a great period of their time in jail and in difficulty of one sort or another. But they were in the fight for nationalism and I suppose that they were in the forefront of, of producing what we now have in our own country, our modern democracy. They fought for it way, way back at that time, along with many other people, of course, especially politicians. But uh, they, that's the kind of stuff they were doing. And the, most of them are unsung heroes. The supplement was given free with last week's edition of The Champion. Almost 20,000 copies were printed. The result caught management by surprise. Oh, we've had a marvellous reaction altogether. The whole, uh, the whole supplement was the paper, actually, when we had done an extra 20%. And... Uh, we, the whole thing was sold out on Thursday, and uh, we have people coming now still looking for copies of it at any price or anything. As the Champions Anniversary Week comes to an end, the in-house celebrations are to continue. The edition of the streets this evening tells how further editions of the copy will be made available. This time they'll be sold at £1.50 per copy. Already, Seamus Finn has been credited with creating a history book for local schools. I tried to put a human face on what happened in Sligo over 150 years, and uh, the only way you can do it is to go in depth into what happened in an area and try to paint a word picture of it and give a graphic account of the actual conditions and leave out the statistics and the uh, dry academic documentation. Outbreak of cholera, 1832. With the carpenters unable to supply enough coffins, most of the dead were wrapped in pitched sheets and rolled into mass graves. It's almost certain that some people were buried alive, so great was the haste to dispose of the bodies. Rock Around the Clock, 1956. After the show, a crowd of self-styled hip cats rocking their way home gathered around the post office where another demonstration of rock and roll got underway. Traffic was disrupted as the crowd belted out the beat on the roofs of parked cars. Hanging, August 1861. The hangman stepped forward, tied Fib's arms, placed a white cap in his head and drew it over his face. The body was left suspended for 45 minutes before being cut down, placed in a coffin, medically examined, and buried in the prison precincts. Extracts there from the Sligo Champions anniversary supplement, serving to highlight the wealth of local history contained in the back issues of our provincial press. Magnificent Markry Castle outside Colony County Sligo, owned by the Cooper family, is a fading monument to the wealth of a bygone era. But at present, the castle and grounds are occupied by the real money men of today, the movie moguls. 
Markree is the setting for a major new four-hour mini-series, The Troubles, the most expensive film production to be located in Ireland since Excalibur. It's being made for London weekend television by an Irish company, Little Bird. Interestingly, the British director of The Troubles, Christopher Moran, has Sligo roots. In the last century, his grandfather emigrated from the area to go and make a bed for Lord Crewe and never returned. Morahan's own track record is very impressive. He put his stamp on the Jewel in the Crown TV series and last month won the Prix Italia for a BBC drama production. So what of his current job? I hope you'll be seeing it at the end of April and the beginning of May next year. I think it's going to be costing in the region, well, just over three million pounds. It's going to be screened on independent television in um, Great UK, and it'll be shown by it's being uh, shown by London Weekend. It's going to be shown on Sunday nights. How have you been progressing so far? Very well. We have very, been very fortunate with the weather. The weather in Sligo this time of year is extremely changeable, but today, which is meant to be a high summer day, it's magnificent, it's quite, quite glorious. It's the best day we've had on the filming, and it's a great pleasure to be here. But it's, even the weather when it's bad, it never seemed to be bad for long. It's bad for about 20 minutes when you get an astonishing rainstorm, and then suddenly the rainbows appear, and the uh, sun shines again. That is up and down, up and down. You quite often go in and out, in and out, too in to avoid the rain and out to catch the sunshine. But it's uh, fine. The troubles necessitates all the paraphernalia of a big time production. The hierarchy around the camera, for instance, includes a Mexican cameraman, the camera operator, the focus puller, clapper loader and grips. It's easy to understand why this is a major source of employment for the Irish film industry. The full-time staff numbers 140. Up to a thousand local extras are being used. There's a seven-week shoot in Colony, two more in Killala, Lissadell and Greystones, and a final six at Ardmore Studios. And back. Fine. Back. No, sir, you weren't looking at my hand, sir. Right. And there we are. A look at the hand. Fine. And back. Right. OK, cut it. And once again, please. The production had a difficult stop-start birth. After three years of negotiations, filming eventually began in England last year, but stopped soon after as a result of a row over a cameraman and a strike. And even though the budget for the Irish relaunch is over £3 million, the shillings are counted at the end of each day. Walter McDonough, an amateur drama stalwart in Sligo for many years, is in another world these days in his role as a special extra. So what's he actually doing? Waiting around quite a bit. At the same time, because I'm interested in amateur drama, I've been watching all the, the work and the repeats and repeats. And I find it very interesting, apart from the boring bit of waiting. And, of course, we're all excited about all these grand costumes we're wearing and all the rest of it. Fascinated by the detail they go to. Is that the thing that strikes you most about yes, the work? Yes, The infinite patience they have and the detail they go to, as I said. For instance, um, my watch chain. It's in a certain buttonhole. And when a gentleman came along and took a Polaroid picture of me, I thought he was uh, going to sell me a souvenir picture. I discovered that uh, he was checking to see which buttonhole the chain was in for continuity. Luckily, I didn't tell him I didn't want a picture. You were going to tell him to go away, were you? I thought it was one of these people selling souvenir pictures. So there you are. The intention is to shoot three minutes of the production each day. The film rushes are being viewed the day after, thanks to an elaborate courier service moving the film for processing to England and back again. A day's work lost because of weather or any other such problem can cost £30,000. The cast includes Ian Charlson of Chariots of Fire and Gandhi fame, Irish actress Emer Gillespie, 
and Ian Richardson, struggling gamefully here to play good tennis. He had prominent roles in the Tinker Tailor Soldier Spy and Blunt TV productions, and has an outstanding reputation in theatre. I've been most places in the world, but usually in a professional capacity, that is, as an actor going somewhere to film some very exotic places. Never to Ireland, and it's a bit remiss, as I say, because one has holidays and Ireland is a very beautiful place. But I have a house in France, and so consequently, whenever I have time off, I go there to justify the expense. 270 civil servants from eight government departments are based in this new office block at Cranmore Sligo. Up to now, they've all been working in a variety of local offices. The building cost almost four million pounds to complete, and because of its bright colours, it's known by local wags as Willy Wonka's Chocolate Factory. The official opening ceremony was performed by Finance Minister Ray McSharry. He availed of the occasion to pledge government commitment to decentralisation. One is only to travel on any of the main routes out of Dublin on a Friday evening to realise the extent to which many people wish to retain connections with their areas. Decentralization is a commitment to those clearly expressed wishes. Afterwards, the minister confirmed that private firms will be constructing government offices at four locations in the near future. Well, I must say we're very pleased with the response to the advertisement of a few weeks ago for the uh, decentralized offices in Sligo, Ballina, Galway and Cavan. Uh, has been enormous, over 100 applications, so there's absolutely no doubt that uh, we will be able to make uh, progress very quickly in this area. And While he was in Sligo, the minister also dismissed reports that the government intends to sell off a number of state companies and to privatise the school bus service. These kind of rumours have been circulating in a number of quarters in recent weeks, he said. The government has not yet taken firm decisions on the matters. Shortly after 2 o'clock this afternoon, Sligo General Hospital was thrown into turmoil when a maintenance apprentice shot a student nurse Dave and immediately afterwards took his own life. Both were aged 20. The hospital administrator, obviously shocked by the tragedy, gave this version of events. Approximately 2.15 uh, this afternoon, a shooting incident took place internally here in the corridor of, on the way to the casualty department of the hospital. Um, Two members of staff, uh, as we understand, it, were involved in, in this. Um, one was a, a student nurse uh, who apparently was, was shot dead, uh, and a, a, another member of staff who was a member of the maintenance staff uh, was later found in a, a plant area close close to the area where the shooting was, uh, took place. Um, uh, he was also dead. The weapon used in the incident was a sawn-off double-barrel shotgun. The student nurse was shot in the chest. The young man had head wounds. Both were thought to have died instantly. The two victims haven't yet been named, as some of their relatives have still um, to be informed. No other person was injured or involved in this tragic incident. A full guard investigation under Superintendent Joseph Noonan is now underway. The bodies are still where they were discovered this afternoon, as the arrival of Garda forensic experts is awaited. As for a possible motive, it's known that the two deceased were friendly with one another until recently. Tara McHugh cannot walk on her own, and she has speech difficulties. The problem was discovered shortly after she was born, when her mother noticed that Tara wasn't responding to people or movements. Mairead was born last year. She cannot sit up and is making no effort to stand. Mairead is unable to keep her head in a central position. Both little girls suffer from lack of balance and their condition has baffled the experts. We have attended um, Sligo General Hospital and we also have attended Central Media Clinic in Dublin and Temple Street Hospital in Dublin. And in fact there are tests ongoing at the moment with Temple Street Hospital. But so far nobody has been able to identify the problem. Tara is attending a local playgroup and had also been going to a special school. At one time it was thought she had cerebral palsy. This has now been ruled out. Her 11-year-old brother, Kieran has not got the disorder, but it must be very disturbing not knowing what exactly the girls are suffering from. It is, I suppose, in a way, but having travelled to various clinics and spoken to people, to parents of children who have much more difficult development problems than our children are, we're thankful that our children are as, as well-developed as they are. 
The McHugh family decided the Peto Institute in Budapest could be the answer to the girls' problems. They made their decision after seeing a television program about the world-famous centre, which teaches patients to overcome their disorder movements and function independently, in spite of their disability. Well, I suppose we hope that eventually it will put them working. Um, if they're able to walk, uh, Tara is six and a half at the moment and she cannot get around by herself. So that if, they, if she could walk by herself, I mean, it would open up a whole new world to her. And we're very confident that um, it would be able to get her walking by herself because we saw videos of um, what they can do for children out there and children that are much more severely affected than Tara have been um, got to walk. So we're very, very hopeful and uh, it would open up all sorts of new possibilities for the, the two of them, really. The arrangements with the Institute are being made by the Dungannon-based Buddy Bear Group, which has already sent 15 Irish children to Hungary. Some doctors are sceptical about what the Institute can achieve. But what about the McHugh's consultants? How do they feel about the children going to Budapest? Well, they are very supportive of us in our decision to bring the children and they have provided medical records and they have told us that they are behind whatever we 100% behind us in what we decide to do. It's not known exactly how much the treatment will cost and if the girls will be accepted by the Institute, but an appeal fund set £50,000 as a target figure. So, how much has been collected? So far we have 45,000 in the bank. We've, we launched on the 8th of September and uh, initially we had intended to sell raffle tickets which had a potential of 20,000. The ICMSA was hoping a crowd of 200 would attend its protest meeting in Trevor Curry. About half that number turned up. An indication perhaps that the organisational skills of the association will be severely tested by this series of 22 meetings over the next fortnight. The ICMSA says that requiring farmers to pay tax on their accounts is not a fair system. It claims farmers will have the expense of going to accountants to set their affairs in order. Will you come to the States? But before you sell an animal, you have to consult your accountant. Before you buy fertilizer, before you do anything on your farm, you will have to consult your accountant. For almost two hours, the attendance was warned the new taxation atmosphere would have detrimental effects. Even a farmer with an income of less than £5,500 could be caught. If not by tax, then maybe his family's entitlement to a third level education grant could be queried. If they are satisfied, for whatever reason, that you will have a lifestyle over and above what it would appear to be indicated in your accounts, you can be turned down uh, for the education grant. Fianna Fáil TD Matt Brennan was in the audience. His Sligo Leitrim party colleague Ray McSharry is to resign his doll seat this week, a fact not lost to one of the platform speakers. We will have a by-election here in springtime in Sligo Leitrim. Now is the time to get voting. Now is the time to tell the politicians what we want, and we'll get out there and do it, and I'm sure you will too. Whereas the ICMSA is opposed to the tax on the account system, the larger farming organisation, the IFA, accepts it. So, will the ICMSA manage to change the government's mind? I think it will probably modify the account system, and we might thinking on it anyway. And that is the system that probably we really need looking at. Because it was highlighted very much, I thought, tonight, the inequities of the account system. So I would assume that from once the government get hold of it and realise the strength of feeling within the farming community, that they will do something about it.